I wasn't exactly in the closet. It was more like I was in the hallway or maybe that weird tiny square of weeds behind an urban apartment building that in a hot rental market would be advertised as having an ample yard. Which is to say, I was just passing through. I was not confused about who I was, nor was I hiding my queerness. But I was single and planning on keeping it that way. I'm now married and the parent of a teenager, but that's a whole other story. In the job interview, it didn't come up. After all, what straight person would go into a job interview and announce, just to let you all know, I am a heterosexual. But then I met my now wife and fairly quickly it became clear that we were going there. By there, I mean, we were going to the finishing each other's sentences, parenting together, conducting married people arguments, sharing a bank account, paying a mortgage, and housing one dog, three cats, and two rabbits. That there. As an aside, my wife, who has more sense than me, has barred me from looking at ads for animals needing to be adopted. That's when I realized I was somewhere between the closet and life because there was this slight little complication. I worked for a church. When I say I worked for a church, I mean that I was the priest. I'm an Anglican priest. And just when it was clear that I wanted and needed to introduce my girlfriend to my congregation, because who doesn't want to share love and joy with others, the Anglican Church of Canada devolved into a no holds barred shit show of a fight about quote unquote same sex marriage. I put same sex in quotes because I think it's lazy and hurtful terminology to use. Gender queer, non binary, and trans folks, I see and love you. Oh dear, obviously I had to come out to my congregation. And obviously I had to do it from the pulpit because then I would have something to physically hang on to. Also, from where else could I confront the absurd and hateful theologies about gender and sexuality that people associate with Jesus? Theologies that Jesus would depose faster than he could call the religious authorities of his own time a brood of vipers. That's my favorite biblical insult, by the way. I prayed and I planned. I sweated and I prayed some more. I stayed up nights turning words over in my mouth, searching for the ones that would say, I love you and I need you to love me too. I had nightmares about a time when I was called into the trauma operating room to anoint a dying man on the table. The man's entire chest cavity was pried open and one of the surgeons was manually compressing his heart rhythmically as if he were squeezing a stress ball. In my nightmare, it was my body on the table, my ribs unhinged like an open door, my fist-sized muscle of life exposed to the world. To give you some context, most of my parish church were folks about 65 years and older. Sedate, nearly almost all white, retired Canadians who enjoyed going to their cottages in the summer, who revered politeness, and who thought the world was just changing too fast. They weren't on the whole rabid conservatives and they'd known me for three years. The church organist was gay and out and his partner had been part of the community for many years, though no one really talked about it. My now wife kept telling me that it was going to be fine. But I was worried about the reactions of a few people in particular. I was living in Montreal at the time and served a church in one of the small Anglophone enclaves of that city. There is a long history of enmity between Anglophones and Francophones there, 
And this one man's hatred of French speakers was rather astounding. Because a large population of Montreal is primarily Francophone, I began integrating French language into worship. He refused to come to church anymore. You would have thought I proposed we dance naked in the woods while worshiping a golden calf. I offered to visit him at home to bring him communion and pray with him, but said I would be continuing to speak French in the church. He said I was welcome to come provided I did not speak any expletive, expletive French. He was one of those people who could be crass, mean, and even hateful, but was kind of marzipan on the inside. He swore worse than many prison inmates I had worked with, but he had the eyes of a lonely old hound dog waiting for their human to come home. A few times he made pretty homophobic comments. I didn't respond. Why bother, I figured. My grandmother was a very conservative person in every way. Napkins had to be folded in a perfect triangle. Children had to be silent at the dinner table. Alcohol, card playing, dancing, and wearing shorts or skirts above mid-calf were not just wrong, they were of the devil. My second worry was a couple I experienced as being conservative like my grandmother. Church leaders had warned me that the couple had repeatedly declared that if a priest ever married a same-sex couple in their church, they would leave. The day arrived. I said the words, I'm queer, to this congregation of older folks who didn't know that queer could be an identity. I told them I was in love. No one screamed or ran out of the church. No one threw tomatoes or deployed homophobic slurs. People were kind. People were warm. Some people seemed confused and a bit quiet, but mostly people were happy for me happy to know I was in love. Then came after. An email arrived with the subject line CONCERNS in all caps. Fuck, I thought, here it comes. The email was from a church leader who described the conservative like grandma couple as extremely upset and needing to talk to me. I took a deep breath and reminded myself that I had handled much worse. I knew the couple would not spit in my face or tell me they looked forward to me burning in hell. I wrote a calm and professional message back to the church leader, assuring her that I had expected the couple would take my coming out with difficulty and that I would be happy to contact them and talk to them about their concerns. Just think about how many times you've supported others when your own heart is breaking, I reminded myself. Be kind, be polite, be your queer self, it will be okay. Five minutes after sending my email reply to the church leader, I received a frantic text in all caps. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. They're not upset about you coming out. They're upset about needing more nursing care for their medical problem. <laughs> I laughed one of those belly laughs that leaves you almost as relieved and fulfilled as great sex. You know, when your heart is fully open and your love and your body hunger dance together. It was even more difficult to tell the congregation from the pulpit that I was leaving them than it was to tell them that I was queer. My girlfriend and I had decided to get married and we planned to move across the country. A few weeks before our wedding, I visited Guy Who Hates the French for the last time. He had become very ill and couldn't have gone to church worship even if he wanted to. He could barely get up off the sofa. I held his hands and told him I would really miss him. He held mine and said, I wish so much that I could come to your wedding. Me too, I said, me too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, That's so beautiful.
What a lovely, lovely thing. And how magnificent that the concern was um, not a concern <laughs> about anything other than their nursing home care. How amazing. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And such a powerful way to be truthful about your story with your congregation. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, be truthful about your story as well as then to um, speak um, kindly to folks who were objecting to you or that you thought might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. My teenager. So <laughs> hello. <Ash. laughs> hello, teenager. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs>